Thank you all very much for uh, coming. It's nice to see a room full on this rather cold night. Uh, indeed, I looked up the temperature in St. Petersburg, where Ayn Rand was born, uh, and it's only just slightly colder than it is here in, in London. Uh, my name is uh, Eamon Butler, and I'm uh, director of the Adam Smith Institute, which is a neoliberal think tank, as we call ourselves these days. Uh, so let me welcome you to uh, Middle Temple, uh, which is part of the Inns of Court. Um, and this, indeed, is the oldest building uh, in the Inns of Court. Uh, dates from 1570. Uh, you may have noticed some scaffolding outside. Uh, this is not because um, uh, buildings of this age need repair from time to time, but because we've decided to replace it with something more rational. Um, Ayn Rand, as you uh, may know, was uh, famously rude about Adam Smith. Um, but uh, nevertheless, it turned out that the Adam Smith Institute in, uh, when was it, 2005, was the only think tank in Europe to commemorate her 100th uh, anniversary. And we've been commemorating her uh, and her work ever since with the Ayn Rand lectures, which have become uh, an annual fixture. Uh, I should say that uh, tonight's lectures, uh, like all of the others, uh, have uh, been made possible uh, by my good friend uh, Carl Barney. There he is on the front row. So thank you very much indeed. Uh, the uh, format is that uh, we will have a talk uh, and then we will have short uh, questions. Uh, and around uh, 8.15 or so, we will break, and you are uh, most welcome to join us for another drink either at the back of the room where you can buy uh, copies of uh, Yaron's uh, book, or if you go out of the doors there, and it's very easy, you turn right, and then you turn right again, and you will find yourself uh, either in the Parliament uh, chambers or the Queen's room, uh, where, uh, which may be a, a little quieter. Uh, and uh, you, you're most welcome until about nine, nine o'clock. The speaker tonight is Yaron Brook, who is executive chairman uh, of the Ayn Rand Institute, which is based in California, but of course uh, dominates the world. He was born in Israel, uh, and uh, like everyone in Israel, uh, joined the army, um, where he served in intelligence. So you must have some brains, eh? <laughs> Uh, indeed, he has a BSc in uh, civil engineering, but then he moved to the United States uh, where he got an MBA uh, and a PhD and became um, a, a very well-known and liked uh, finance professor at Santa Clara uh, University. He's written uh, columns in Forbes and the Wall Street Journal, USA Today, and many, many other publications. He's a uh, co-author of a couple of books called uh, uh, free Market Revolution, How Ayn Rand's Ideas Can End Big Government, which can't be bad, uh, and uh, most recently, Equal is Unfair, The Misguided Fight Against Income Inequality. He uh, has uh, co-founded a uh, private equity and hedge fund manager, uh, which is entirely appropriate for this evening because his topic for this evening is the morality of finance. Yaron Brook. Thank you. Thank you, Eamon. Thank you, Matson, wherever you are out there. And, and thank you to the Adam Smith Institute, which has been a, a friend not only to Ayn Rand, uh, but a friend to the Ayn Rand Institute and to me personally uh, for, for many years now. So it's, it's always been a pleasure uh, to work with you. And wow, look at this place. Isn't this amazing? I can just see Shylock up here trying to defend himself. <laughs> right? I think this is uh, where uh, Shakespeare's Tempest was premiered. Somebody told me in this, in this room, but it, 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 deserves, it deserves Shylock. How many, I'm just curious, how many uh, in the room uh, work in the finance industry, if I, if I could just get a show of hands. Okay, quite a few, about I'd say half, maybe a little bit more than half. That's good. Um, and to a large extent, uh, I think tonight's talk, you know, is for you. You know, this is, this is a moral defense, I hope, 
you will take it as, I'm all defense, of what you do. Because throughout history, you've been called evil, blood-sucking, money-grubbing parasites. Authorities in the Middle Ages damned you as, quote, spiders, toads, and all creatures diabolical. Medieval artists, think Dante's Inferno, place you in the seventh rung of hell with a bag of gold around your neck, pulling you down into the fire. Right? That's financiers. Your actions were sinful, according to the Catholic Church, and, quote, a great huge monster like a werewolf, according to Martin Luther. In the 20th century, both left wing and often the Christian right hate you. The writer Ezra Pound, the American writer Ezra Pound, described the work of financiers as, quote, the core of evil, the burning hell without let up, unquote. Shakespeare, of course, in his famous play, The Merchant of Venice, portrays you as an evil, greedy, lustful. It's a great play, by the way. If you haven't seen The Merchant of Venice, go see it. It is fabulous, and there's actually a movie of it with Al Pacino playing Shylock, which is terrific. Uh, but it's not just Shakespeare. It's Dickens and Dostoevsky and pretty much any modern book, literature, or popular fiction. The villains are almost always financiers who are condemned as useless, overpaid, paper-shuffling parasites. Now, this has been true not just of, the, of literature. Philosophers have condemned you. Economists often condemn you. Even those who advocate for free markets often say, yes, but with finance, we need to regulate you a little bit. We need to control you. If you look at uh, murders on television, this is a great statistic, you know. You know how many murders, in American television, I'm not sure what the statistic would look like uh, on, on British television. But if you look at murders on television, do you know that 52% of all murders on television are committed by successful businessmen? <laughs> Most of whom are financiers. I don't know if you know the percentage in real life. It's, you know, really, really small, well below 1% of crimes are actually committed by those people. But this is the portrayal, the popular portrayal, the common portrayal, the historical portrayal of finance has been as, as bad leeches, as bad human beings, as horrible, greedy monsters. And what an injustice this is. Because indeed, there is no developed country in the world that does not have a developed, sophisticated, robust financial industry. And there is a direct causal relationship between having financiers, having bankers, having a sophisticated industry and financial and economic growth and wealth creation. There's not been a period of history where there was wealth without finance. Finance, finance and financiers and financial institutions and finance mark, financial markets at the heart of all economic development. All you have to do is look today at somewhere like Silicon Valley. And yeah, we focus on the entrepreneurs. But think of all the financiers that had to make those entrepreneurs possible. Think of all the venture capitalists who go unnamed, who took money and made massive investments in all these successful startups. And by the way, for every one of those successful startups, lost money on about nine of their investments. There is no area of business, there's no area of industry, there's no area of production where financiers have not been at the heart, at the core, helping and spurring it along. So the question we want to ask tonight is why are they so hated? And is there an actual moral defense for what they do, given their success, I guess? <laughs> so I think there are three reasons, three reasons for the, the, 
for the fact that financiers are as hated as they are? I think the first is just sheer ignorance. People just don't understand. Finance is hard, it's complicated, and it's very poorly explained. And people just don't understand. They, they see, they see uh, financiers sitting in fancy offices and uh, going about to meetings and shuffling papers, or today shuffling emails, and they say, what do they actually do, right? If, if you see an entrepreneur, uh, 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 let's say Bill Gates, or, yeah, you can see what they actually did. They created the software and I use that software and cool. Yeah, I get it. I get why this is productive. But what do derivatives have to do with this? And what do hedge funds have to do with it? And why does private equity have to do with any of this? That just seems like shuffling money and it's making money from money. That seems wrong in some way. So people are just ignorant of the very facts. And there's a wonderful, there's a wonderful quotation that illustrates this from uh, uh, Thomas Wolfe's The Bonfire of the Vanities. I don't know how many of you read uh, The Bonfire of the Vanities, a, a best-selling book in the 1980s. And it was about a bonds trader, not just any bonds trader, about the master of the universe. One could even think it was about a little bit uh, hints of Michael Milken uh, in, in, in its portrayal. But in the book, this master of the universe, this all-knowing financier, has to explain what he does to his young daughter. So this is the exchange between them. The daughter, he, the daughter asks him what he does, and he says, I'm a bond trader. And, and she says, well, what's a bond? So this is, this is his attempt to explain what it is that he does. A bond is a way of loaning people money. Let's say you want to build a road. And it's not a little road, but a big highway, like the highway we took to Maine last summer. Or you want to build a big hospital. Well, that requires a lot of money, more money than you could ever get by just going to the bank. So what you do is you issue what are called bonds. You build roads and hospitals, Daddy. That's what you do. No, I don't actually build them. Right? I handle the bonds, and the bonds are what make it possible you help build them. Well, in a way, which ones? Which ones? You said roads and hospitals. Well, not anyone specifically, right? The road to Maine? Now, in, in, in the background, of course, his parents are there giggling and, and finding this very amusing, the whole phenomena of this. No, not the... And then his mother steps in. I think you're in over your head, Sherman. Now, of course, his wife then steps in and explains what bond traders really do to the daughter. And this is a classic, right? Daddy doesn't build the roads or hospitals, and he doesn't help build them. But he does handle the bonds for the people who raise the money. Bonds, the little girl says? Yes. Just imagine that a bond is a slice of cake, and you didn't bake the cake. But every time you hand somebody a slice of a cake, a tiny little bit comes off, like a little crumb, and you can keep that. Everybody's having a good time at this explanation. Little crumbs, the girl says. Yes, says his wife. Or you have to imagine little crumbs, but a lot of little crumbs. Right? If you pass around enough slices of cake, then pretty soon you have enough crumbs to make your own gigantic cake. So notice, I mean, I love the cake illusion. You know, and if you heard my inequality talk, I talk about there about the pie illusion because the they're so, they're, they're, they're exactly the way people talk about capitalism and about production and about finance. Because they want, it, they want to make it clear to you that it's zero sum. All your daddy does, he doesn't bake the cake, he doesn't make the cake. All he does is he gets a little crumbs. And he doesn't really do anything. He just distributes the, the, the slices of cake, which he didn't build, which he didn't make. And those crumbs can make you rich if you get enough of those crumbs. And the whole point is to make the case that he's just a paper shuffling parasite. He hasn't really done, anybody can distribute a cake. Anybody can slice a cake and hand the pieces out. There's no attempt, no attempt, to provide an actual productive reason for what he does and why he earns the kind of money that he does. So those of you in finance would probably appreciate that quote. I'm sure, I'm sure you could do a better job explaining to your daughter, hopefully, what it is you actually do. Uh, but even in this book about the master of the universe, this is the best that they could come up with. So I think, one, we don't understand the actual productive value 
the financiers actually contribute. Two, we don't know the history, and this is, this is a much broader statement, it goes beyond finance. We don't know history, we, we just don't. Uh, you know, in, in, in my view, maybe the most important era in human history, certainly from a production perspective, from a wealth perspective, is the 19th century, the Industrial Revolution. And we know almost nothing about the Industrial Revolution. Our kids in school don't study it, and if they do study it, or they study it, but then they learn, what do they learn? Uh, pollution, child labor, and I don't know, some other horrible thing about what happened during the 19th century. Which, and if you're confused about pollution and child labor in the 19th century, please ask me in the Q&A. I love to give answers about that. But do you know, and, uh, do you know that uh, what the wealth of, of, of the average wealth of people was before the Industrial Revolution. So the United Nations, the United Nations defines extreme poverty. Now, I don't usually quote the United Nations, but the numbers here are just too good. Um, extreme poverty is below $3 a day. What was the average earnings, income, of, of people before the Industrial Revolution? Well below $3 a day. Well below three dollars a day. Indeed, about ninety-five percent of human population on Earth, including Western Europe and the United States, was making less than three dollars a day. Now, I'm not cheating. This is inflation-adjusted. So this is today's dollars. Imagine, all of you, what it would be like to live on three dollars a day. Right? And we're talking about not just the period just before the Industrial Revolution. We're talking about ten thousand years of human history. For 10,000 years, people did not really earn more than $3 a day. I mean, things got a little bit better under Rome or Greece, and then it got worse under the, you know, the, the, the Middle Ages, and then they got a little bit better in the Renaissance. But generally, things were pretty rough. Life expectancy, under 40. Right? What did children do? I, I guess I'm answering the question from the Q&A. What did children do before the Industrial Revolution? They died. More than 50% of all children before the age didn't make age 10. And they worked from sunrise to sunset on the farm. There was no schooling. There are very few periods in human history where children actually went to school. That is a modern phenomenon. And of course, we judge all of history based on our standards today. So here's this period, this glorious 19th century period, where Income shoots through the roof. Life expectancy shoots through the roof. By every human, by every measure of human prosperity, we do fantastic during this period. And we know nothing about it. So we know very little about history and the history of finance as a piece of that. And then finally, we have had no moral defense, not only of financiers, but of what financiers actually deal with, the idea of making money. Indeed, making money, profit, has always been deemed suspect at best, evil at worst. So we don't know what they do. We don't know the history and how they've contributed to anything. And we're suspicious of them because it's the one profession that actually makes money. Making money is what you do. It's not that you're making money by selling a product. You're making money. When you go to work as a financier, what you're supposed to do is take money and use it to make money. That's the essential characteristic. So I'm going to try to cover all three. The productive, uh, I, we're going to do very little history. There's no time. Um, and, and we will end with them all. But let me encourage you to, to buy my book, because there I go into a lot more detail uh, about all of these, uh, all of these issues. So let's start with how finance actually enriches the world. And, and for some of you, this might be pretty basic, but I, I think it's good for everybody to hear it again. How does finance actually enrich the world? What is the core function of financial institutions, financiers, financial markets? Well, the core function is to make possible saving and to convert those savings into investments. That's a core function of finance. 
is to make it possible for human beings to save money. And saving is crucial for human life. It makes possible long-term thinking. It makes possible long-term planning. It makes possible the reduction of risk. I'm not living from paycheck to paycheck. I've got some money in the bank or I've got some money invested away. So for the, the saver, this is crucial for a successful, happy, prosperous life. If you think about what money represents, right? what money represents, money represents our effort. Money represents our time. Money represents our energy, our productive energy. And when we save that money, we are saving productive energy. We are making it possible for us to, to start a business, to buy a house, to, to, to consume, to live. Now think about what saving was like before financial institutions. You'd stick it in the mattress. And if somebody stole it, it was gone. You had no security, you had no interest, it didn't accumulate, it just was just whatever you put away in the mattress, that was your saving. Now today, well maybe not exactly today, but generally, over the last 200 years, we've had the ability to put money away and actually get a return, to see it compound year after year and actually grow. And if we invest it wisely, it could actually grow quite fast and provide for a good retirement, provide for starting a real business, provide, again, for life, for living. But how does that happen? Imagine a world in which you know you want a return on your money, but there are no financial institutions and there are no financial markets. So you might go and you might find a local businessman who's looking for funds and you might negotiate some deal with them and you invest in their business in exchange for some kind of return. But that's hard. You have to go and choose who, you know, who needs money. You have to find them. You then have to assess the riskiness of the investment. You then have to make sure that you have enough money for the loan. They might be looking for more or they might be looking for less than what you actually want to invest. It's hard for you to control the risk because you're putting all your money in one basket, right? to one investment, it's almost impossible to do. And, and as a consequence, when you don't have financial institutions, what really happens is people put money in the mattress. They don't earn a return because it's way too difficult and hard. What do financiers do? Financiers make it possible for you to invest in them. One place, call it a bank, gives you a, some kind of interest. Forget that they don't today. I, I, you know, I didn't envision negative interest rates when I, you know, I don't think anybody in finance has ever envisioned negative interest rates. It's a, it's a, it's a phenomenon of the modern world. Um, you put the money in the bank or in a mutual fund or in some other financial instrument, and you can put a lump sum, and all you have to worry about is the riskiness of this one financial institution. And then what does this financial institution do? It turns around and makes those investments that you would have liked to have made. It is specialized in assessing risk, in assessing the character of the person they're giving the money to. They have specialized in making good investments. This is what a stock market does. Not every company gets listed, why? Because not every company is worthy of getting listed, has the potential to grow, is justified in raising as much capital as a stock market can provide. In every one of the areas of financial institutions, of financiers, the essential is that they are deploying your, all of our savings for productive purposes. And what they are specializing in is in evaluating those productive purposes, making sure that they are really productive, and assessing the riskiness of those proposals. Of those. This is a crucial function within capitalism, within any system of freedom. Think about what happens when we get rid of them and we centrally plan it all. Think about the kind of investments that happen when the government does it. Whether it's the white elephants in Japan when they decided they were going to become 
They're world leaders in petrochemicals, and the government funneled huge amounts of capital into pet petrochemicals, and you can travel around Japan and see these massive plants that are empty and have never been used. To, of course, the Soviet Union and all the waste and horrors that that entails. One of the magical things is, when you look at the financial markets and institutions, is how good they are at what they do. How often you get positive returns on your investments. How often you're actually earning a return on your saving. We take it for granted. Stock market goes up every year. But none of that is take, should be taken for granted. That is a testament, the fact that it goes up, to the productive ability of the people running the companies, but also to the productive ability of the people financing the people running the companies. So financial markets, financiers, connect savers, connect savings to investment. They turn savings. They turn what we have decided we're going to postpone consumption, right? The money we're not going to spend right now and turn that into productive investments in our economy. And I don't know of a more crucial role than that in a free market. Now, everybody benefits here. The borrower benefits because they're getting a return. The financier benefits because they're getting even a bigger return on what they're investing in. And the person receiving the money on the production side, the company, is now has capital to do what? Hire people, buy plant and equipment, and actually go and make stuff and produce and create and build. One of the great injustices and, and just mythologies that, that uh, we have in the modern economic world is the idea that consumption drives an economy. I mean, it drives me nuts. So if only we handed out pieces of paper to people and they went out to shops and they bought stuff, the economy would thrive. But in real world, where do you get the money in order to consume? You have to work for it. And if you're on welfare, somebody else has to work for it and then the money's stolen from them and given to you. But somebody has to work for it. So somebody has to produce so that there is money for you to consume. And of course, what are you consuming? Stuff that's being produced. The fundamental in every economy is production. Indeed, this economics should and must be the study of production. Under what conditions production happens? And how do we optimize production? Consumption is easy. Give anybody a bunch of money and they'll go and consume, right? That's not hard. Put them in a mall and it happens instantaneously. Production is hard. Production requires effort. It requires thinking. It requires figuring out and creating values that people, that people want. Values for other people who are willing to pay for those values more than what you put into it, which is what a profit is. The difference between what other people value your goods at and what it costs you to actually produce them. So, Finance is at the core of creating production, which is at the core of economic activity. There's no economic activity without the producer. There are no employees until you have capital. There's no you know, factory until you have capital. Right? It's, not, it's, it's never been the case, and if somebody has a county example, please share it. But I've never seen a situation where labor just organically shows up and build something all by themselves. Not now. In the Q&A, if you want to give me an example, great. Just shows up and makes something. That's never the case. What actually happens is somebody has an idea. And in order to deploy that idea, in order to make the idea reality, they have to go to financier and raise some capital. And then that capital is used to pay employees' salaries. Because I don't know very many employees who are willing to work for years and years and years until the company has a profit for nothing. They want to be paid, whether the company's profitable or not. Who's taking, who's paying them? Who's paying them while the company is not making any money? How, how long does it take a biotech company to become profitable? 
20 years maybe, 10 years, 15 years. Those scientists, put aside physical laborers, those scientists, they're working for free during that period and just waiting for the company to become profitable and then they'll just take a percentage of the profits, right? No, they want their salaries. So who's paying those salaries? The finance guys, the capitalists. Right? They're paying the salaries, they're paying the equipment, they're paying the rent, they're paying it all. And if you're in biotech, half the time or maybe 80% of the time, you never achieve profitability and you'll never get your money back. You're counting on that one where you do and you make a lot of money on it, right? To compensate for all the ones where you didn't get any. There is no production without the capitalist. There is no production without the financier. There are no jobs in an economy without finance. There are no jobs without the Rothschilds and, the, and all the banks that surround us. The banks create the jobs. They need somebody who has an idea. They need an entrepreneur. But the entrepreneur by himself cannot create the jobs. The jobs are created with a combination of an idea and money, an idea and finance. Really what finance is about as a productive endeavor in the end of the day is an industry that matches talent or matches money with talent. It finds the talent and invests in the talent. Maybe the most obvious case of that is Silicon Valley is the venture capital community. But everyone, every financier at some level or another is helping that process happen. In Silicon Valley, you come, you pitch an idea, most of the time they say no, but even a stinky, long-haired, you know, Steve Jobs, who nobody wanted to be in the same room with because he never showered. He didn't, this is a true story. But he had a great idea. And somebody saw the value of that idea and wrote him that first $50,000 check and then hundreds of thousands and then millions of dollars. And today, biggest company in the world. All because one venture capitalist saw beyond the long hair and the hippie nature of Steve Jobs, saw an idea, saw the potential, and was willing to risk real money on that potential. And he could have lost it all. Apple came a number of times quite close to bankruptcy. You're matching money with talent. All finance does this, of course. Now, some of us in finance might be involved on the risk mitigation side. And again, I'm not going to get into a whole discussion of futures and derivatives. You can ask me in the Q&A. But what is that, what are all that whole industry of derivatives exist to do? To mitigate the risk of providing capital. To mitigate the risk of doing business to mitigate the risk to creating goods and jobs and the wealth that, again, we all enjoy in a society. So we match talent with money. We reduce risk. We increase liquidity, which, again, provides more capital available to producers. And on the other side of it, Finance also makes consumption possible. Consumption beyond our means. I love consumption beyond my means. I think it's cool, right? Imagine if you had to wait. Now, this is an American context, so I hope this works in England, right? Imagine if you had to wait until you could buy your house for cash. So every year, you would put money aside, and you put money aside, and, put, and after 30 years, you would buy your house, your dream house. Right? Instead, because of something called a mortgage, some innovation somebody came up with about 100 years ago, you can actually buy the house before you have the money to pay for it. That is really cool. You can enjoy this house for 30 years, and then you, fully, you own it fully. Who cares? But you've enjoyed it for 30 years. And you pay a little bit of interest for that enjoyment. And we buy automobiles that way. We use our credit cards in shopping malls. It, the convenience of modern day consumption is, is just unbelievable, all made possible by these paper shuffling greedy bastards, right? Now, everything I've described, and granted this is pretty simplified and pretty, pretty basic, everything I described you could say that in the Middle Ages was not very well understood. At the time of the Medici banks, 
Uh, you know, people didn't really get finance. They didn't get money. They didn't get the relationship between how you could get money from money. Aristotle called money, called, uh, uh, money barren. And therefore, you should not be allowed to receive interest on money because it, it didn't grow. You know, you gave somebody a dollar and the dollar was still a dollar. Whereas, for example, if you gave somebody seeds, plant seeds, and you planted them, something new grew out of those seeds. So that was okay to demand more seeds in return. But money would just stay the same. And forever that was kind of the conception. But since the Middle Ages, economist after economist after economist have explained these things. And you can actually track the whole history of how they start to understand what financiers actually do and how finance actually creates production and makes us all wealthier and makes us all better off. And for a hundred years at least, probably more like 150, 200 years, we have understood everything I've said so far. There's no mystery to this. So I get that some people just don't have an education in this and they're ignorant still about the virtues of finance. But anybody who considers himself an intellectual, anybody who studied a little bit of economics, anybody who knows the history of Eco economics, of wealth creation, has no excuse. There's no excuse not to know this stuff. There's no excuse not to understand how productively important what finance does is. But no. Every crisis that happens is immediately blamed on financiers, even before we know what happened. Right, we saw this in 2008. A very complex crisis with many subsidiary causes, with a lot of moving parts, with a lot of things happening, but the day Lehman went under, capitalism had failed. And financiers were at fault, and Wall Street was to blame, and we should put them in jail. Immediately the day after. There wasn't even time to contemplate. Nobody looked at the data. Nobody looked at anything else. We knew immediately, instinctually. It's all financiers. Same with the Great Depression. To this day, we teach our kids that the Great Depression was caused by speculation on Wall Street. Now, no even half-decent economist actually believes that anymore. An overwhelming majority of economists, even those who tend to the left, agree today that the Great Depression was not caused by Wall Street speculation. It was caused by multiple things, again, if you want to know, but Federal Reserve and uh, central banking and gold and uh, bad policies by Hoover and FDR and so on and so forth. But it wasn't speculation on Wall Street. That doesn't cause a Great Depression. It doesn't cause a 2008 financial crisis. I think the first Ayn Rand lecture was given here by John Allison, the former CEO of BB&T, who talked about the financial crisis. And one of the things he likes to say is, it couldn't have been greed on Wall Street. There was no more greed on Wall Street in 2007 than there was in 2004 than there was in 1994. There's always greed on Wall Street. That's their job, to make money from money. That's their job title. That's their job definition. And it didn't change before 2008. So it doesn't matter what the actual facts are. We, again, like to vilify these guys. We like to vilify finance. So this brings me to the point about history. We just don't know it. We don't know economic history. We don't understand. We don't understand kind of the evolution of economics. We don't know. I mean, we do know, but most people don't know what caused the financial crisis and what caused the Great Depression and what caused the 19th century and what caused the great increase in wealth that we have seen over the last 250 years. And if you don't know these things, it's all just mumbo jumbo to you. And as a consequence, you get all these ignorant statements about finance and about financiers. We don't understand what banks do. We're suspicious of banks. We're resentful of banks. From the Medici's, or really from the money changes that Jesus threw out of the temple, all the way to the Medici's and the Rothschilds to the, to the you know, J.P. Morgans of today. We really don't understand the origins of the Industrial Revolution and the core important role that bankers and financiers play in making that possible. It could not have happened without the capitalists. This is why I, I by the way, love the word capitalism. I know there's some, in, in some who don't like capitalism because Marx came up with the term. 
Who cares who came up with it? It's a great term. Because at the core of free markets, at the core of economic wealth creation, at the core of economic progress is capital, is the deployment of capital, the selection of who to give the capital to, and, 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 and who to back and who not to back. It's not an accident that the United States, in order to develop during the 19th century, had to import bankers from Europe, because it didn't have any local. J.P. Morgan is probably the best example of this one of the greatest bankers in history, who seeded many of the great industries, many of the great companies of the 19th century that created the foundation of American prosperity. We don't understand even our modern day. I used to, I used to teach during the 90s. And, uh, and kids used to come up to me and said, you know, 90s were a pretty good time. Stock market was going through the roof. And there was a lot of prosperity. And few people felt rich. And, and unemployment was historical lows. And people used to come to me and say, who's responsible for these good times? You know, is it Bill Clinton? Or is it Alan Greenspan? Right, those are the choices. And I used to say, it can't be a politician. Right? It can't be a politician. The best they can do, the best a politician can do is get barriers out of the way. But they don't actually create anything. Barriers out of the way for whom? It's the people who actually create the stuff that count. And it can't be the chairman of the Federal Reserve. Because again, you can ask me about this, but all the, all the Federal Reserve, all the central bank can do is be destructive. It cannot actually be productive. So who, who created the prosperity of the 1990s? And some will say, well, it was Ronald Reagan and so on. Again, politicians. That can't be the answer. The name I gave for the prosperity of the 1990s, and I stand by it, is a guy who got sentenced to 10 years in jail for trumped up charges. A guy who had to apologize for being a successful financier. A guy who, who's on, who's back of, Rudolf Giuliani made a political career. And that person is Michael Milken. I don't know how many of you remember Michael Milken, one of my personal heroes. Michael Milken make it, made it possible during the 1980s to completely restructure the American economy. It is stunning to look at economic numbers, not economic numbers at the ma macro level, but at the micro level. To look at American companies, to look at their efficiency, to look at how they produced and what they made, and how awful they were in the 1970s, and how uncompetitive they were in the 1970s. And then fast forward to the 1990s and look at those same companies. Or if they didn't exist, which most of them didn't exist, Look at them and you. And what made that transformation is Michael Milken and people like Michael Milken. I mean, where did Silicon Valley come from in the 1980s? How did so much capital show up in Silicon Valley in the 1980s? You know, this is the era of uh, the PC. This is the era of, uh, of early Steve Jobs. This is the era of Bill Gates. This is the era of Larry Ellison and, and uh, Sun Microsystems and all the what now are considered relatively old technology companies, but that really changed America. It was by, it was private equity firms, it was leveraged buyouts, it was Michael Milken unleashing the capitalists on the old industries that were not productive, that, that were wasteful, shutting them down. But capital doesn't go to waste. Where did the capital go to? It went from the Rust Belt to Silicon Valley. The capital was redeployed from wasteful production to futuristic, wealth-creating, innovative production. Silicon Valley was made possible by the Rust Belt shutting down, by shifting capital to its most productive use, which is what finance and financiers do so, do so well. You cannot understand America's success economically over the last 30 years without understanding what Milken and the hostile takeover artists, like Carl Icahn, who's still around, did during that period. And they are vilified, and they've been criminalized. Milken served in jail uh, exactly for the, because of their success, their unbelievable success at transforming the American economy from a conglomerate-based economy, unproductive, to a focused, lean, incredibly productive 
industri industrial world during the 1990s. Of course, since then, we've passed laws to bring back the 1970s because we like it so much. Now, there's one area in which you know, capitalists or, or, or free marketers always criticize banks and financial markets and institutions because they seem to be to so in bed with government. And it, it, it's true. I mean, uh, how many Goldman Sachs chairmen have now been Treasury Secretaries of the United States? It's like a revolving door. It, uh, you know, I don't know what Trump had in mind in terms of the swamp, but everybody surrounds Donald Trump today is from Goldman Sachs as every other president has surrounded himself with Goldman Sachs people in the past. It seems like there is this complete immersion between government and Wall Street. Now that is a justifiable criticism. And many say, well, they rig the game so that they can make money at everybody else's expense. And there's a certain truth to that. But again, you have to know history to understand where that comes from. And I'm not going to go into the whole story, but I mean, from the beginnings of time, kings wanted to control banks. Why? Because that's where the money was. And if you wanted to wage a war, it was much easier to, to have the bank print the money for you and to create special rules or to just take over the bank so that you could go to war. So government has always had an interest in finance. And if the government shows an interest in you, it's tough to resist. They show up with guns, or swords, as the case may be in a long time ago. They show up with force. They show up with coercion. And that relationship, there's no question that over time is corrupting of the business, of the banking, of the financiers. There's no question that many of them manipulate the system and game the system and, and endorse continued cronyism into the future. But one has to remember where it starts. When government gets out of the way, businesses are quite happy to run their business and not have to go groveling to Washington. J.P. Morgan, the great American banker, saved the U.S. economy from a deep recession in 1907, basically single-handedly. He got other bankers into a room, locked the door, cut a deal, and saved the economy. And for a while, a short while, he was considered quite a hero. Until politicians thought about this more deeply and said, wait a minute, we're letting a banker have this much power? We're letting a banker have this much control? How dare he? He's just an individual. We're much more important. And in 1913, J.P. Morgan gets dragged in front of Congress in one of the most humiliating displays ever in America and gets accused of all kinds of things, particularly about the 1907 crisis, which he bailed the whole country out. And out of those hearings came the Federal Reserve, came central banking. Not because central banking is good, not because anybody thinks central banking actually reduces the number of crises. Pretty much economic history suggests the opposite but because central banking allows the politicians, the government, to now control, to be the heroes and the villains, to control that financial world that used to be dominated by J.P. Morgan. And what's funny is, and this leads to the mall issue, right? What's funny is that when J.P. Morgan had power, he had a lot of power on the financial markets and the U.S. economy, he had a lot of power. And we don't trust power, right, when it's in individual hands when it's in a businessman's hands. So we want to get away from that. That's why we have antitrust laws and all kinds of laws to make sure that individuals in business don't have too much power. But we are quite happy to give politicians power and to give bureaucrats power. Because as much power in the financial industry as J.P. Morgan ever had, the Federal Reserve has a thousand times more power over the financial industry, a thousand times more power over the economy. And nobody worries about that. Nobody's ever concerned about Alan Greenspan having too much power. Why? What is it about a J.P. Morgan that we don't trust, that we don't believe in, that we're worried about, that we're suspicious of as a culture? Why is he doing what he's doing? Why did he bail out the economy in 1907? Because he loves me and you and all of us? 
No. Why did he do it? Because he wanted to make money. Because he was being selfish. He was being self-interested. He was doing it for himself and for J.P. Morgan. And believe me, the deals he cut were very beneficial to J.P. Morgan. They came out of the crisis in good shape. And why do, so we don't trust that. But why do we trust Alan Greenspan? Or Ben Bernanke, or Janet Yellen, or what's his name now? Powell, who's gonna be the next one, right? Why do we trust him? Why, or, or why, why do we trust them? Because they're not doing it for themselves. They're doing it for the public interest. They're doing it for the common good. They're doing it for the country. They really do love you. So, we don't trust self-interest. Therefore, we don't trust profit. We don't trust businessmen. And of all businessmen, the ones who are most obviously nakedly out for profit are financiers. We believe in a collectivistic ethic, in an ethic that says what's good is what's good, what's the public good, the common good. And what's really good is not if you provide value, because all these guys provide value, all these businessmen and, 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 and financiers provide value. At the end of the day, what's really good is if you sacrifice, is if you give without expecting a return, is if you act selflessly. The standard of morality that our culture has adopted is a standard of selflessness. That is virtue. That is good. That's why we love philanthropists. Even though they don't change the world, they have very little impact on the world. I mean, I'm not against philanthropy, but let's be real. Right? It's great, but it doesn't change the world. Like a J.P. Morgan changed the world. Like a Bill Gates changed the world. Like a Steve Jobs changed the world. Business changes the world. Business makes people better, billions of people, but they do it for themselves, and we cannot stand that. So what we need for moral defense of financiers is not just understand the productive nature of what they do and the historical benefits we have all received from them. We have to adopt a new ethic. And that new ethic, the only new ethic I know that does this is Ayn Rand's. An ethic of rational self-interest. And for those of you interested, I, I recommend you read The Virtue of Selfishness by Ayn Rand in spite of the intimidating title. Right. It's an individualistic ethic. It's an ethic focused on human flourishing. On what are the things that produce individual human flourishing, individual happiness at the end of the day. And if you look at bankers, at financiers, they have been incredibly good for human flourishing, for my flourishing, for each one of your flourishing. And how do they do it? They do it by exercising their mind, by choosing, by, by, by figuring out who to invest in and who not to invest in, who to support, who not to support. They're incredibly productive. They are rational. And everything they do is based on the trader principle. Right? They provide you with capital. What do they get in return? A opportunity for much higher returns in the future. You're better off, and they're better off. Win-win. So Ayn Rand's ethic of rational self-interest is an ethic of individual rationality, individual productiveness, and a trader principle. To find Rand to be moral is to maximize the win-win relationships you have in your life. It's to think, it's to produce, and to trade with other human beings. And profit, the money that they make, is at the end of the day an indication of how good you are at being a trader, and how good you are at being a thinker, and how good you are at being a producer how good you are at creating values that people love, that people want, that people are willing to pay for. And their payment is an indication of how much they want it, how much they desire it, and how much good it does for their lives. So profit 
is a symbol of virtue. You know, honestly made, productively made, is a symbol of virtue. It's a symbol of value creation. It's a symbol of how much you have changed the world. So for all those financiers in the room, all those in the financial industry, you should be proud of what you do. You are the makers and shapers of the modern industrial world, of modern business. Without you, literally the world would collapse. Industry would collapse. Jobs would not exist. The values that we all take for granted from our iPhone to the food that we eat would not be there. You make the world turn. You make the world that we live in possible, and you should be proud of it, and don't let anybody tell you otherwise. Thank you all. Thank you very much, uh, Yaron. We have uh, 20 minutes or so for questions. Uh, short questions, please, or very short comments. Uh, and only one question. Anybody who says, I've got three questions, is not going to get past the first one. Uh, we have a roving microphone, Jonas, there. And what I will do is I'll take a few in the same general area. So I'll start at the front with uh, these three uh, gentlemen here. Could you start there, Jonas? Uh, yep. Yeah. I know who you are, but could you say who you are? Yeah, yeah. okay. My name's Sheldon Wilkie, and uh, I think my question refers to the 2008 financial sure. uh, crash. Uh, I think one of the problems people have, the anger amongst the general public, is that we are paying for the bankers' mistakes in the sense of there was a massive bailout by government, and I think that has annoyed the public no end. And that is why we've seen the rise of Corbyn. Everyone feels that we're paying for their mistakes, and they should carry the can, not the general public. So I certainly agree with that. Uh, you know, the bailouts are wrong, they're immoral, they're taking money from some to the others. But the real villains of the 2008 crisis are not bankers. The cause that made the 2008 happen have nothing to do with bankers. Bankers were just doing what they were incentivized to do by politicians. If you look at the core reasons for the financial crisis, and I've given a six-hour course on this, so I'm not going to I'm not going to repeat it, but it's it's mistakes by the Federal Reserve and the English Central Bank and the European Central Bank that kept interest rates below the rate of inflation for two and a half years, thus creating an environment in which everybody wanted to borrow money. It's the fact that that money got funneled into housing because the U.S. government on a massive scale, unprecedented massive scale, was subsidizing housing and encourages us all to invest in housing. It was Freddie and Fannie, criminal organizations that were fraudulent and yet have been let, nobody's been, nobody's been prosecuted there. Nobody has any problem with their bailout and, and the fact that the people who ran them into the ground did nothing. And indeed, the two congressmen most responsible for the financial crisis in my book are Christopher Dodd and, uh, and what's his name, Frank, uh, uh, Bonnie Frank, Bonnie Frank, right? And they get the bill that's going to fix it all named after them. So yes, the public is angered, bankers being bailed out, but what they should really be angry about is that our politicians have screwed up our economy so badly that the financial crisis happened. What they should really be mad about is Bernanke and Alan Greenspan, who mismanaged the central bank during that period, at least in the United States. That's what they should really be mad. And then, of course, they should really be bad at too big to fail. It's not that bankers went groveling before, uh, before the Fed for too big to fail. Too big to fail was, was introduced by the Federal Reserve in 1984 when they bailed out continental Illinois and basically declared to the world that we will not allow a big bank in the United States to fail. So are you surprised that bankers behaved in a way that suggests that they believed they would never fail? But instead of going to the root cause, we go to the superficial cause, which is bank bailouts. Yeah, we're all against bank bailouts, but that's not what's, what's really going on. What's really going on is the regulatory environment, the Federal Reserve environment, and the, and the politicians muddling in stuff they shouldn't be muddling in.
I think you struck a nerve there, uh, Sheldon. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Anthony van der Elst. Um, my iPhone was made in China. I wonder if you'd take the opportunity to counter the fashionable <laughs> criticism of trading with third world countries and financing businesses in those countries uh, where wages are way below what first world uh, would consider to be adequate living wage. And you might at the same time perhaps talk about um, child labor in the 19th century. Yes, uh, absolutely. So uh, let me just correct you because your iPhone was not made in China. It turns out your iPhone was made in about 40 to 60 different countries. If you actually look at the different components, where they came from, where they were produced, how they were integrated, and the, the amazing supply chain that brought them all together, to an assembly plant in China where they happened to put everything together. But it was made in all those 40 countries. And in all those 40 countries, what the iPhone has done is created jobs. Jobs where jobs did not exist before. We're not talking about these, um, these Chinese laborers having a cushy middle class lives and having wonderful jobs, and then Apple came in and destroyed all those jobs, and now they have to, they have to uh, work for, I don't know, $3, uh, no, $5, $10 a day, right? No. These are Chinese who worked in the fields, who were starving. Don't forget, in, in the 1960s, 60 million Chinese died of starvation. These are Chinese who come from the from the outskirts of China, from the rural areas of China where they have nothing. And they come and work, and they work hard. And from the wages that they get, not only do they feed and house themselves, but they send money back to their family in those rural areas. And they learn a skill, and they get better at the skill, and they become more and more productive, and their wages rise. And in, 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 Asia, in China, we have seen the creation of a middle class that is more than 500 million people strong. If you've ever been to China, it's stunning, stunning what's going on. But you can't get to middle classhood unless you have a job. And when you're not very productive, you're not going to get a lot of wages. That's why children <laughs> didn't make a lot of money. Right? So you have to start somewhere. And you have to start in most of these countries with child labor because what's the, what's the alternative for the children? It's starvation. I mean, we can sit here in Europe, right, in our cushy middle class, you know, uh, uh, lifestyles and complain about children in China. But the alternative for those children is death. So they're working. Not so much in China, but Indonesia and other places, right? And as their parents get rich, what happens to those children? They take them out of the workforce and put them in schools. That's what happened in this country. It wasn't child labor laws that got rid of child labor. It was the wealth of parents that got rid of child labor. And it was the fact, how many of you manage people? Imagine managing a group of 12-year-olds. <laughs> not fun, not very productive. Children are not very productive. So it's the fact that those children were replaced by machines, by, better, by more productivity, that eliminated child labor. Right? It wasn't, the laws came after. The laws, once the ch child labor was gone, the laws came about. So, I'm a huge fan of, of, uh, of labor in China and Indonesia and sweatshops and any opportunity you can give people to have a job that is better than what they have right now that improves their lives. I'm all for that. Charlie Amos, Aldeglai. Would you be at all interested in abolishing limited liability and reintroducing the debt prison to ensure that people that make a loss actually had to pay the suppliers back with the consequence of not doing so being stealing. So I was wondering what your thoughts no, were on because, that. No, because everybody who gives, everybody who gives a, a, a business a loan where the business has limited liability knows the risk. There's no fraud going on here. When I, buy, when I lend money by buying a bond of Apple, I know that if Apple, you know, that Apple might not be able to pay me back. That's part of the risk. They have limited liability. I can't go to the shareholders. Indeed, I don't believe, as many libertarians believe, that limited liability is a state-created thing. Limited liability is a contract. The contract basically says, the corporation is a nexus of contracts. And one of those contracts basically says, you can, you can lend money to the corporation, but the corporation, in paying you back, will not go to its shareholders. That's just a contractual agreement. 
And as long as it's open, as long as everybody knows what it is, what's the problem? Indeed, the system with limited liability functions beautifully. And, and people lose money because sometimes you lose. That's the risk that you take. That's the nature of being in business and being in finance. But I see nothing wrong. Indeed, I see a lot good in, uh, in limited liability. And I can go through a whole string of the benefits of limited liability relative to its cost. Okay, I'm going to take some from this side now. There's somebody right at the wall there and some at the front. Let's do that first, yeah. Um, first, thank you for your lecture. It was very insightful. Can you say who you are? Um, yes, my name is Alexandra Kashuta. And um, what I wanted to ask you about was what is your position towards what Milton Friedman called the, the negative income tax or some sort of uh, universal basic subsidy, given the fact that maybe this new breed of creative destruction, automation of a different kind, of a more intelligent kind, will hollow out yep. the this less productive? This time we'll be right. We've been wrong for 200 years, but this time we got it right. I'm not, I'm not for helps. it. I'm just asking what no, you I think know, about I it. I know, I know, I <laughs> know. So uh, uh, what do I think of universal basic income or negative income tax or, or an equivalent of universal basic income? So I'm, I'm a little split on this, right? Because I can tell you one thing, the current welfare system is a disaster. It's corrupt. They, I think in the United States, at any given state, you might have 200 different welfare programs where you're receiving goodies from, right? And it's just, it's just a mess. What it creates is hundreds of bureaucrats, a whole bureaucratic establishment that's engaged in welfare. So if you could get rid of all of that and simplify it with one payment and that's it, that's kind of appealing. However, <laughs> I also think it's a disaster because what it does is it basically morally makes acceptable the idea that some people don't have to work, that some people are always going to live on the dole, that some people, and, and I think it's a disaster for them, not just for you who has to pay for it, but for the people receiving it, because uh, as I talked about jobs, it's not just about making the money. The money is the least important thing about a job. The most important thing about the job is that it gives you self-esteem. It gives you the confidence that you can live on this earth, that you can produce the, the, the things that you need in order to consume, that you can take care of your family and, and the people you love. So we, by universal basic income, we're basically telling a whole class of people, you're worthless. You're useless, so we're going to write you a check. Don't worry about working. The robots are going to take it over anyway, right? And I think that's a horrific message to send. So I would like to replace the welfare state, but with nothing, not with a different welfare entitlement, not with a different welfare standard, even if it's more efficient, which it is. I only have one question, but first I'll answer yours. In the United States, almost all the fire departments have paid professionals working alongside volunteer labor, and uh, except in Colorado Springs, where their uh, government reduction effort eliminated the fire departments in several neighborhoods, and in Kansas, similar things can be said about hospitals. But my question is to follow up on Milton Friedman's. Why was he more interested in the negative income tax or universal basic income instead of the earned income tax credit, which, if you believe that uh, extremes of uh, everybody having all the wealth and everybody else having none is less productive than a normal distribution uh, such as we might see in nature. Uh, why was Milton Friedman not in favor of the earned income tax credit? Well, I mean, the earned income tax credit is a form of a negative income tax and indeed was inspired, was inspired by Milton Friedman's idea of a negative income tax. No, it's a negative payroll tax, I agree, but it, it was inspired by his idea of a negative income tax. Um, I don't know how he differentiated between the two and why he wanted one over the other, but, but I believe, I don't agree with you about this idea that in unfettered capitalism, what you get is all the wealth goes to a few people. I think that's nonsense, and, and again, one of those Marxist predictions that never happened and never will happen, and, and the economic theory suggests that it cannot happen, and, and in reality, it doesn't. Um, and I, I recommend my other book, Equal is Unfair, if, if you're interested in, in a discussion, in a detailed discussion of the whole inequality, in the whole inequality debate. Um, but Milton Friedman, I think, was very concerned about how to create politically palatable, um, uh, minimizing distortions in the marketplace programs. So the negative income tax for him was a way to, uh, that was politically palatable to give people a little bit of welfare 
without doing too much, more efficient, more productive, and while not distorting the free market, which I think it does. I think, though, that it has other negative consequences, as explained about UBI. Somebody in, in the middle there. Yeah. Tom, I think. Yeah. Yeah, and, uh, Tom Burrows. Uh, I'm a, one of those wealth management journalists. Um, question about um, insider dealing. One of my favorite speeches in any Hollywood movie is when Michael Douglas gives his famous greed is good speech at the uh, Roosevelt Hotel, to be exact. And I once likened it as um, Ayn Rand on acid in terms of its um, brilliance of that speech. I want to ask you about insider dealing. Sure. What's your view about it? Should they be legalized? Should it be up to individual exchanges to decide as to whether certain forms of transactions should be on or off? I mean, what's your view about insider dealing in general? Well, let me first say something about Michael Douglas' speech, because it is a brilliant speech and true. From the first word to the last word, 100% true. And what's amazing is it's in the voice of the villain. He's the bad guy, and it's purposefully done, right? So you're, because the audience assumes everything he said was wrong, because he's the villain. And not only that, as soon as he finishes, I mean, Oliver Stone is a brilliant movie maker. As soon as he finishes, I don't know if you remember what song comes on. I mean, the camera switches to the SEC investigating him. That's the first scene after he finishes his speech. And a song comes on. It's Frank Sinatra, Let Us Dance Among the Stars, da da da. In other words, this is all frivolous nonsense. That's the kind of emotional response that Oliver Stone is trying to evoke, even though, as you say, the speech is brilliant. Later on, Michael Douglas gives his real speech, where he says, we financiers, it's all zero sum. Everything we make is somebody else's expenses. If I make, it means you lose, which, which is the real Michael Douglas speech, which is what really represents Oliver Stone's view of, of finance and of, uh, of, of that character. Um, I agree with you, I think, in, in terms of insider trading. Um, insider trading should not be criminalized. It should be up to the exchanges and up to the relationship between shareholders and management. So it's obvious that you never want the CEO to short his own shares, right? Because that creates some pretty perverse incentives. Um, but there, there's law in the books that would protect you from doing that, like fiduciary duty, right? It would violate his fiduciary duty to maximize shareholder wealth. So you don't need a whole new set of laws to prevent him from shorting his own stock. You could also have, if you believe that insider trading was bad, and there's, there's conflicting literature on this, uh, you could have shareholders write into the contract when they hire the CEO, you cannot trade in the stock except under these conditions, which is fine. I think the more interesting solution is if you had different exchanges, have different insider trading regimes, and let them compete. So and, and you want to list at the NYC? We don't allow any insider trading. We're very strict about this, and we have very strict rules. But in the NASDAQ, we're kind of loose about it. You want to tr insider trade? Fine. And let's see who wins, right? Let's see what regime actually works. This is not something that you can um, abstractly figure out uh, the, the right context. And it might be different for different industries. It might be different. It's like accounting standards. I don't believe in accounting standards dictated from the top. I believe there should be competing accounting standards. And, and exchanges can adopt particular accounting standards that are different than other exchanges. And we'd have a much more competitive, vibrant, I think, corporate governance world than we do today. I think corporate governance is, is stifling. It's, it's, it's destructive to productivity the way it's structured today. I, I had a, a very unfortunate friend who was a, a dealer. And he was at lunch and was given some very sensitive market information, quite illegally. Um, but then he was conflicted because there was one regulation saying he had to tell his clients that he knew this, and another one saying if he did tell his clients, that would be insider trading. So he went to jail whichever way. Very unfortunate. Anyway, uh, let's... Um, <laughs> yeah, he's out now, thank goodness. Right, uh, let's go to the extreme far left. No, 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 not there. Even further, further. No. There we go. Or if you're looking from your side, it might be the extreme far right. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, Michael Ezra. <coughs> My question is a bit of a follow-on from the previous question. <coughs> you mentioned that Michael Milken was one of your heroes. Yes. And you also said that he, what he'd gone to prison for was for being successful. Yes. I mean, he actually went to prison for securities fraud. And uh, 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 insider's dealing was suspected, but that's not in part of the plea bargain. didn't come up. So if we just look at the securities fraud that he actually went to... <coughs> 
in part he was fined, I think, $400 million for that bit alone, was ripping off basically investors with warrants by, put, by investing them with his so, own So I get the question. I disagree with all of that. It's not true that he was convicted of security fraud. Some of the stuff he was, he was convicted of five accounts. I think three of them were tax related. Two of them were kind of security fraud, but minor violations in which everybody in the past had gotten a slap on the wrist and a fine, and the judge said, I'm going to make an example of you and send you for 10 years in jail. But more than that, Michael Milken didn't go to court because the SEC basically told him that if he dragged this out, they would go after his brother, they would go after his father, they would drag his entire family into court. They were out to destroy him. The best book on Michael Milken ever written is a, is a book called Paycheck by, uh, by uh, Dinah Feischel, who is a professor of, economic, of uh, law at, at Chicago University. I encourage you. But nothing Michael Milken did was at the expense of shareholders, was at the expense of, of people he had a fiduciary responsibility towards. Okay, well, sorry, to come back on that point, uh, uh, what, that's what you're saying. According to the court at the, or the court at a particular point in time, and what he actually pleaded to, was on the four hundred million dollar minor fine. security it was violations. Six hundred million dollar fine is hardly a minor security, a minor, a minor violation. So someone that pleads and, and agrees to that is not exactly like a parking ticket. And in terms of that four hundred million dollar fine, what it actually was was warrants that he'd given in, in part to his family members as opposed to the end investors. Now, according to that, and so so my question I, basically I, I think is, I'd like to do you think that you should that you be able to rip off investors? Out afterwards, but, uh, I do not believe any of those counts were legitimate. I do not believe Michael Milken did anything wrong. I, do not, I believe that he pleaded because, because as so many businessmen in this room probably know that when the government comes after you and, and it, with, with, with criminal prosecution, it's much easier to plead than to fight. And, uh, and the cost to Michael Milken, it was easier for him to cut a deal than it was to fight it through. And I think it's one of the great tragedies of, of the late 20th century, the fact that Michael Milken didn't go to court, didn't stand up to them, and didn't prove the allegations false, uh, and instead settled. But so many businesses, if, if, by that standard, every one of the banks uh, you know, that, that cuts a deal with the, with the regulators is criminally, you, know, you already assume they're guilty. I always assume that they're innocent, and that these bastards at the government are, are, are going after them and using the guns that they have to, to, to force them into a plea, which is exactly what they do, right? Why did J.B. Diamond, why did J.P. Morgan have more fines against the post-financial crisis than any other bank? When J.P. Morgan probably had no losses during the financial crisis, had a clean portfolio, did everything kind of right, was, was brilliantly managed, but it paid the biggest fines. The only reason is, is that J.P. Morgan was the only bank CEO other than John Allison to criticize Dodd Frank and to personally criticize Barack Obama. And you don't do that. And if you do that, the regulators are coming after you. Why did one of the rating agencies get a huge fine and the other two not get big fines? Because it was the only rating agency that lowered the ratings for US government bonds. But they acted exactly the same as the other rating agencies when it came to the mortgage crisis. But the regulators wait after them as a vendetta for them daring to, to lower, uh, to, to lower the, the, the government bonds when the government bonds should have been lowered in the ratings. So I, I, I'm sorry, I don't trust the court system anymore. I don't trust prosecutors at, anymore. I certainly don't trust the attorney generals. I've seen personally what they do and how they vindictive they are and how anti-justice and rule of law they are. So the fact that somebody settles, you know, it's sad but I don't assume that they're guilty at all. I'm gonna take three very, very speedy last questions and I'm gonna take them together so Aaron can, can round up. Gentleman there, then the gentleman in blue, and then the gentleman right in the middle there. Very quick question about a, a specific market, and maybe you can give a, a, a general answer to it. So talk about the foreign exchange market. $5.5 trillion a day traded on the foreign exchange market, while trade, international trade, you can drop on your foot or even software, is less than a tenth of that, okay? So your, your topic is about uh, uh, ethics in markets and morality in markets. So where do you draw the line? So where is it just moving money, for, for no real purpose, 
high frequency trading, for example. So we have, we have almost $6 trillion a day traded every day. Is this moral? Is this ethical? Okay, sure. We got it, we got it. All right, the gentleman in blue, come on, run, run, run. Jonas, yeah. Okay. That's gonna be hard. Thank you, my name's David Millen. I just hope uh, you could explain uh, an apparent inconsistency. If I understood your theme correctly, uh, banking and finance uh, promote all the good things in life. Uh, government promotes the bad things in life. Um, and then subsequently, you told us that all US governments had been advised by alumni of Goldman Sachs. Do you, do you see any contradiction in that? <laughs> Gen gentleman there, last question. Thank you. Nicholas Pine. Bearing in mind what you said in the first half of your lecture about central bankers, do you approve of quantitative, uh, of quantitative e easing? Of what? I didn't understand. Of quantitative easing. Yeah. All right, let's see if we can uh, put these all together. Um, when you see large markets like high frequency trading and foreign exchange, where large volumes of money are transacting without any obvious, although I think there are some uh, productive benefits. It, you you got to really think, why, why is this happening? Because in a, in a, in a rational market, it, it wouldn't make any sense to, to, for money to just slush around for no apparent reason. And whenever you do that, and this goes, I guess, to the point earlier, what you discover is some government regulation that has created this market. High frequency uh, trading is a great example of this, particularly in the United States. It used to be that you traded some stocks in the NYC and different stocks in the NASDAQ and different stocks in Philadelphia and different stocks in different exchanges. And there was no high frequency trading because there was no advantage to it. But there was a regulation that basically said you have, to trade, you have to be able to trade all the stocks and all the exchanges for no apparent reason, a complete violation of property rights, a complete abrogation of what it meant to have different exchanges. And now suddenly you, you had arbitrage opportunities because in fractional of seconds there were differences between how the stock traded in Philadelphia and how the truck stock traded in New York and you could make a little bit of money by, by, by taking advantage of that, of that. That wouldn't come about in a free market. That can only exist because some central planner thinks he's smart and these are kind of the unintended consequences of that. Now I would add that what high frequency traders also do is provide massive liquidity by the way, how much does it cost you to trade a stock today? How many cents? Nothing, almost. It's almost zero. The transaction cost of trading a stock today is almost zero. What was the transaction cost of trading a stock in the 1970s? It, it could have been $50. So what high-frequency trading or similar things have done is massively increased liquidity and dramatically lowered the cost of trading stocks, which I think is a benefit at the end of the day. Um, foreign exchange, if we want to go global gold standard, there wouldn't be a foreign exchange trading market like there is today. It, you, you know, what was done with the Nixon going off the gold standard and basically uh, turning all currencies into floating currencies, um, you know, has created this opportunity and people are taking advantage of it. Now again, I think there's a productive purpose there. Uh, you know, what George Soros did to the pound years and years ago was very healthy, ultimately, for the English economy. Uh, what, what, what hedge funds do to currencies when they move and they put pressure, for example, in the Asian economies in 1998 to completely reform themselves, that was healthy. There was market discipline on uh, uh, economies out of control, of governments that are out of control, which brings me to the question of my opinion of government. I have a generally very, very low opinion of all governments today. I think government is a necessary good, but it is today being so abused that, it, that it, it, almost everything they do is tinged with horror. So uh, government is, according to George Washington's second inaugural address, government is a gun. Government is force. Government is coercion. There is no role for force, coercion, and, and, and a gun in market transactions. You don't need it for insider trading. You don't need it to, to arbitrate between a trade between two individuals. What you need a gun for is to protect us from crooks. Now, I would have some respect for these people if they caught Bernie Madoff. 
Man, what boon he made of? But the people, I have a hard time calling the people, but the people at SEC were so busy reading my 13 Ds and my 13 Gs and how much I traded in this stock and how much I traded in that stock and what my intentions were, which are all legitimate, to, to any time to investigate Boney Madoff. They got a stack of papers like this from a hedge fund manager two years in a row explaining exactly the pyramid scheme that Boney Madoff was engaged in and they ignored it. Or they went and superficially looked at his books and, and, and did nothing. The one job government has is to catch crooks and criminals and to put them in jail. The one job that it has is to get real fraudsters and put them away. It's to protect me from the Bernie Madoffs in the world. And they can't do that. And, I, I, and I, you can't blame them for not doing it because they're too busy investigating all of us. It's like the NSA is too busy listening to every single one in this room to actually catch a terrorist. The SEC is too busy looking at all of your papers to actually catch a Bernie Madoff. So it's not that I object to government, I object to the governments we have today, which uh, have take, bought a gun, bought force, bought coercion, bought the authority into places that it does not belong in, in ways that are horrific. Uh, you know, if you're in the financial industry, and I know many of you are, you know the tons and tons and tons of regulations that you have to abide by that do actual zero benefit to the world out there that don't help you, that don't help your customers, that don't help your clients, that are just there for the real paper shufflers, for the real parasites at the SEC and the English regulatory bodies to keep their jobs and to, and to, and to embolden their power lusting over the real productive people in this economy, which are the financiers and the business people. Right? And it makes me mad. And the reason it makes me mad is because because business is such a beautiful thing. Finance is such a beautiful thing. Left alone, we change the world. We build economic you know, uh, powerhouses. We actually, we actually increase the standard of living or being of humanity. A billion people have come out of poverty over the last uh, 30 years, not because of regulators, not because of government, not because of bureaucrats, but because of businessmen in China and India and places like that. That is so beautiful to see human beings rise up and be successful and create wealth and live a good life. And then to watch that destroyed, literally destroyed, like in the case of Michael Milken, by putting them, the, the most productive in jail, the most able in jail, it just rips me apart. I mean, it's, it's, it's tragic, it's sad, it's horrible. So yes, I despise government as it is today. And I love finance. I love production, I love productivity, I love businessmen, because they make my life better. And what was the last question? I can't remember. Quantitative easing, very quickly. Quantitative easing. I don't believe there should be a Federal Reserve. I believe in private banking. Uh, quantitative easing, I think, was, was a, a massive central planning scheme to try to manage the economy. It's true that there was a huge liquidity crunch. They had to increase liquidity in the markets, and maybe that was the only way they could do it. But uh, you know, they overran it, they overdid it, and I think unwinding it is going to be messy. And I'm not a fan, but I'm not a fan of central banking. I mean, I think anything a central bank does is ultimately flawed. Why? Because it's a central planned plan. The, the only good indication of how much money should be in an economy or, how, or what interest rate should be at is the supply and demand of loanable funds, savings and demand for loans. It should be a market transaction that determines interest rates, and it should be the private circulation of money by, through private incentives and, and profit and financiers that determine the supply of money. And as soon as you put a central planner in, in any area, whether it's finance or anything else, you mess it up. So it's not that I blame central bankers. I think anything they do would be flawed. Thank you all.